Well, hello again. Today, we're working our way through towards the end of July, <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that Emily had actually mentioned, uh, we were at dinner with the neighbors and we were talking about yard games and things, and Emily said, you know, I'd kind of like to have a tetherball pole installed. And I said, really? Okay. <laughs> so that was on the uh, 17th. And this is the 20th. And this is a tetherball pole. Well, it's technically a fence post. Uh, but we're going to use it as a tetherball pole. And I'm going to try and see if I can get it to double function uh, as a badminton or uh, potentially volleyball net. Uh, for the area that we're going to put it. And so I'm marking the positions for an eye bolt to go towards the top and an eye bolt to go uh, at the top and bottom of where the net needs to be. And at the moment that's kind of what I'm looking up is trying to confirm uh, exactly how high that that needs to be. Um, That's one of the, you know, benefits of internet and all kinds of random information available. So, uh, the the downside is that technically the tetherball pole should be about two and a half feet taller than this ended up being. So I might have to uh, I might have to build another one with just the one screw at the top. Uh, and then put it in a uh, you know tire filled with concrete so I can roll it around and wheel it wherever we want, which we talked about doing, but um, we decided that it might be smarter to try it in a, in a permanent position. So the I'm drilling the three holes, well six technically holes, but three spots for the for the eye bolts. And then I'll put those in. Although, uh, to get the size of eye bolt that I want, uh, here at our local hardware store in town, um, they did not have what I needed. Uh, so I kind of have to rig it. Um, so I ended up getting a couple of of regular uh, hooks that were the thickness uh, that I thickness and length that I needed, and then I'll end up having to use a, a torch to heat them up and then uh, bend them and close them so they're eye hooks, uh, and that's what you see in the little black case sitting on the wheel wheel is, is my uh, my little propane torch. So I mean you know it works. Pretty well. The downside is that since a lot of the stuff is um, zinc treated, when you heat that up, the zinc starts to burn off. So you got to be careful to not m to make sure you're not inhaling any of those fumes. Um, and then you have to find a way to treat it uh, to make sure that you get it protected from the weather and from rust, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so I'll just use I'll end up using some spray paint on that. Um, In other news, though, this week we actually had met with the building site uh, inspector uh, for the home, and we talked about, we walked around, we actually drove up to the site. Uh, that was a requirement that he had to, uh, before he, could, he would come back to inspect it, because we actually had him out here oh, a year and a half ago, I think. Um, and talked about what was needed and, and got a rough idea. And then we were actually talking about a, a different location on the property. But uh, with this particular site, um, I, I took that rough idea that I knew already and just applied it. And, and I'd actually gotten it pretty close, although uh, one of the things that I'll have to fix is the 
slope. I, I assumed they would want some slope for uh, drainage around the house, but um, he actually said no, that the, the, the site needed to actually be completely flat and level. Uh, so I'm currently working on that, but he also, we talked about the, the uh, turn to get up to the site and pulled out a tape measure and, and dem he demonstrated how wide I would need that to be uh, because, you know, it's a 13 foot wide, 58 foot long house section um, with a four foot tongue on the front of it. So it's, it's, it's got to have a pretty wide turn. Um, we ended up, uh, I ended up clearing a pretty good chunk of land, uh, for that so that, so that, uh, we can get that turn up there. I'll still need to do some, uh, grading and get some gravel down and things like that. But <laughs> it was, it's this, uh, spot right here, actually, let's see. All right, so if you follow the little red arrow there, that's kind of the path the driveway takes. So that area uh, directly uh, behind me and on the screen uh, was all cleared out and is now a nice wide pathway. Uh, and one of the... So we have 30 acres, half of which is about uh, a 50% incline hill. And it's been a little bit uh, frustrating because we we need places to put stuff, and we just don't have many places. Like you, you know, I mean, it's 30 acres, but it's covered in forest, and for a good half the year, it's super wet and not something that you can drive on, for instance. So parking is always a challenge for us, um, and after I was I was sitting here. Um, after I got that, that cleared and, and roughly smoothed out with the, with the bucket, Emily came home from work one, uh, that, that day and I said, Hey, uh, did you notice the driveway? And she turned around and was pretty surprised <laughs> about the fact that it was all cleared out. And I said, look, we have a place to park the vehicles now. <laughs> we just have to get some gravel. Um. Because I mean, it's got to be a, a wide enough turn for the uh, for when we bring the mobile home in that it can actually get uh, around the around the bend here, uh, and we we may actually have to take. Uh, there's a couple of, of trees on the corner here that are leaning a bit sharply. Uh, we may actually have to take those down, uh, but we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as so as we've got to put gravel down for the for the mobile home, but, um, other than when it's actually being delivered, it's just basically dead flat gravel covered space. So why not use it as a parking spot? It'll also help for when we end up building the barn, uh, because the, the road will turn right there to get in, into the barn area. So that'll actually make things easy at that point uh, to shift over but uh, at the moment I'm just in the video I'm, I'm working on the um, turning these hooks into uh, from S hooks or whatever they're just regular hook into an actual I hook I figured this was easier and cheaper to do it this way by hand than it is to drive into Chehalis and by an eye bolt. So there we go. I mean, the metal is really quite simple to, uh, to manipulate. It's, it, you, yeah. The downside is just, or the danger side is just making sure you don't touch it until it's had time to cool. Um, so, um, I'm going to leave that just kind of where it is for a while. And I actually decided that the easiest way to move everything from here to where it needs to be was actually to just use the, the tractor. Uh, so I'm going to go get the tractor and then we'll just put everything in the bucket 
and drive it up there. Nice and simple. But uh, yeah, so everything on the other side of the tractor, all of that is now cleared and leveled. Um, it can actually, forest work can be pretty, pretty dangerous. I actually got injured mildly injured twice during that process um, as I was working I was pulling on one of the hazelnut trees and with the with the backhoe and I didn't realize that uh, like I said I just wasn't paying enough attention to what it was doing um, but it actually had a pretty good bend uh, the lower half of it was buried under shrubs and so I couldn't actually see what I you know where I was pulling on it and as it as I as the backhoe started to arc, uh, as I moved it to the left, the tree actually ended up with enough of a, a bend that it basically became a spring and pinned my leg in between the, the tractor and the tree. Um, so I've got a pretty good uh, pretty good injury there on my ankle, which has been you know super fun to deal with. Uh, and then there was another time that a small branch got caught on the roll cage and came whipping around and bumped me in the forehead. Just enough to give me a bruise, but not enough to do anything. But There's a part of me that says I should have gotten a cab tractor. Um, and then the rest of me says, nah, that would have been even more stupid. It might have, might not have even prevented either injury, and then I'd have to pay for broken glass to replace. <laughs> So, yeah, it is what it is. Um, but at this point, we're we're just talking about the uh, the games that we want to play and how much space they need. Um, and I was just looking at the like technically a tetherball court, uh, how much space around the pole you actually need, and, and then we're we're talking about the. Uh, you know, badminton court, for instance, if you're if you're going to actually have a, a decent sized badminton court. And then one of the things that when I'd originally designed this as a um, kind of a place that we could just play some boche, I liked that the, it's kind of rimmed to the north uh, with those trees there on the left side of the screen, and. I had, I had left them intentionally uh, so that it just kind of created that ring and it sort of felt like you were actually playing in a forest. Oh, but now we've had the Emerald Ash Borer confirmed in uh, Portland for three years now, and, which is an hour and a half south of us, and in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, was it was confirmed to be there this year. Uh, oh, I wanted to show you there the, the clay. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but, uh, yeah, this, this stupid little bug has been moving its way across the country, and we knew it was a matter of time. Um, we'd actually hoped we'd have 10 or 15 years before it worked its way uh, all the way across the country, but it seems to have... It actually jumped from, like, Colorado all the way across to... to Portland, um, which is kind of crazy. And then with it being up in Portland, uh, we figure it's now a matter of, you know, one to three years before it gets here and uh, we'll lose all of our ash trees. So one of the things we decided was uh, at some point I'll go th come up here and, and push these ash trees over and widen the space so that it'll be a uh, a better space. So the the position that we've got for the um, pole here is is actually going to be a nice midpoint. What of what this field, what this little field will actually end up being. Um, but I'm just trying to make sure I dig down uh, three feet, 
and I showed Emily some of the clay and so straight here she, you can see her um, actually modeling with it and that's how pure this clay is um, it kind of really kind of surprised us um, so she she just carved a little like a little wolf head um, it it yeah it's it's almost pure clay it's 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 amazing I actually have the idea in the back of my head that I might someday like I might harvest some of it as I'm digging other projects and then uh, run it through a, a filter soak it run it through a filter and, and kind of clean it up and purify it and maybe try and make some uh, actual tile uh, for you know a mudroom bathroom kitchen I don't know I think that might be kind of cool to have tile that I actually make myself um, you could totally use it for pottery if you wanted to um, that's something I've had in the back of my head that I played with a little bit in school when I was younger but it wasn't a wasn't something that I got into enough to really do more than just the one or two projects that were required um, for whatever whatever class that was it was like a combination of home ec and and a couple of other classes I don't remember but I, don't, I should say I don't remember what it was called but anyway so yeah there there we go we now have a tetherball pole installed um, I just have to wash the concrete off my arms there I have learned for sure that uh, cement is not something my skin likes um, I've actually had a had some chemical burns a couple of times from doing cement and I didn't wash it off the in fact the concrete pad for this particular pavilion I didn't know any better <laughs> I'd never done much with concrete and never done anything by myself with it and so I was just crawling around you know screeding and moving the concrete by hand and oh that's something I'll definitely never do again um, that was that was definitely some fairly severe chemical burns so I'm very careful about making sure I keep that washed um, we're trying to see what kind of rock it was um, one of them had split it in half uh, and uh, I was trying to pick at it with the, with the screwdriver on my pocket knife just to see if I could chip some of it out seeing I don't know I'm not a geologist so I don't know that I actually g gleaned anything from that <laughs> but at this point I just asked Emily if she thought it looked decent with the rocks the way they are and she clearly thought they were uh, this is another one of those tools that are kind of invaluable to have if you're homesteading or you know, know you're going to be doing a lot of work or you might have to dig or something um, I believe it's called a mattock um, it's got a spike on one end and kind of a thin shovel almost a trenching shovel on the other end I've had heard a lot of people call it a pickaxe before but it's not actually a pickaxe because it's not an axe on the one side um, although I mean, I guess you technically could sharpen it and use it as a sort of an axe, but I'm taking advantage of the fact that I've got to dig up a lot of this grass here, and so I'm trying to break up the root clusters and leave all the dirt where I can use the dirt, um, but then make a pile out of the grass, and that'll all become uh, rabbit fodder, so that'll make a good snack for the for the bunnies so one of the things I'm trying to accomplish here I, I already did this on the left side of the walkway but I'm trying to dig this down a little bit so any water that comes off the roof for instance uh, or just that 
piles up um, will actually be guided towards the hazelnut tree, which is just the little tree right there uh, behind me and in front of the ATV. Um, the hazelnut here on the left side of the screen actually has done extremely well where it is, and I think the reason is just because the the roof is dumping a bunch of water there, uh, where the and and we've got a bunch of blueberries over here uh, off screen that have also done extremely well there, and the, uh, the hazelnut and the blueberries on the right there don't seem to be doing quite as well. So if I can guide a little bit of extra water in that direction, that's my hope is that that'll help those guys. <clears throat> so there's a there's a fair amount that needed to be moved and uh, again I'm, I'm super surprised. I don't know why but <laughs> just surprised how how much of a difference the little rock border actually makes so it just feels a lot more finished uh, kind of makes me want to actually um, get the, the logs in place and um, get them you know get that arbor built so this kind of feels more like an, a guided entryway, the way that we want. And interestingly, we've been learning more and more about the... Uh, uh, totally switching tracks here. Um, the intolerance IBS kind of issues that I've had for a long time, and just never really... I've just learned to avoid certain fruits particularly. Uh, banana, kiwi, uh, avocado, cantaloupe, um, cucumbers, which are all things that I thoroughly enjoy, but I've learned that being out here in Washington, I haven't actually had issues with those, and uh, since we've now learned that I'm you know, allergic to pretty much all grass and the maple and birch families of trees, it makes me wonder if the problem that I really have always been struggling with is actually a, uh, an issue with the pollen, because um, I've I've enjoyed watermelon uh, several times since we moved out here and haven't had a had an issue. So I've enjoyed bananas a couple times and likewise haven't had any problems. So I kind of want to try some kiwi uh, next because I love kiwi and I have not enjoyed kiwi in a very, very long time, like going on maybe 10 years. Um, and we wanted to plant some kiwi uh, plants just because they actually grow out here. Um, that was what the original plan for this arbor was that would go here over this, this uh, entryway. And if I can eat kiwi, then that's definitely a selling point to get some some kiwi plants growing here. Uh, this next next spring, this coming spring, if we can, I don't know, but uh, that'll be interesting to experiment with. Um, so yeah, so the the process here is pretty simple. Um, I mean, it's just mix up a little bit of concrete, throw it down where the rocks need to go, and then just kind of push the rocks down into it once it cures it. You just lock them into place, then we can fill that back up with um, with the the gravel and smooth that all out, and it'll stay in place. Um, aside from when the chickens decide to scratch it up and uh, kick it all around, although that we we have uh, we actually have a, a source to get a couple of of geese. Um, which we've enjoyed uh, having geese for for uh, feast dinners, and uh, this year we we bought some geese to for, uh, for that purpose to have a couple of feasts, and Emily came across a, a 
particular source that has a couple to give away, or well, not not quite give away, but they they're freshly, you know, they're goslings, um, and uh, they're gonna sell them to her for a pretty cheap price. So we're probably gonna be finishing our chicken fence here in the next week, so that we can have a place to to put the geese. Um, but anyway, uh, I ended up with one bag of cement left, and uh, or concrete left, and we've been using the extra cement from various projects to fill this particular little area under our where we like to hang our laundry. But that'll be the end of the footage for today, so as always, thank you for watching. God bless you and yours, and stay safe out there.